Simon, good day. Before Islam, there were many types of marriages prevailing amongst Arabs and other nations, and they were all associated with tribal and social customs. Islamic teachings address these types of marriage by either confirming some of them, or regulating some of them, or prohibiting some of them, or by temporarily approving for an interim period some others. Islamic teachings established overarching boundaries for marriage, aiming at, number one, maintaining healthy family conditions conducive of raising physically and mentally stable offspring. Second, maintaining social and personal chastity as a foundation to conserve acknowledged bloodline and ancestry, which is a key requirement to observe parental accountabilities towards offspring and preserve their rights. Third, set a respectful frame to the male or female sexual needs while maintaining chastity requirements, mutual rights, and peace of mind. Fourth, protecting the society from sexually transmitted diseases that may spread with uncontrolled relationships. Accordingly, when addressing muta marriage or temporary marriage as a pre-Islamic existing type of marriage, we can find that it has been tentatively regulated and allowed for an interim period before it is prohibited by the Prophet himself. When the need for it changed at, at the final stage before the Prophet's death, it was unneeded and it was abolished. As can be seen through this uh, authentic hadith narrated by Al-Bukhari that the Prophet himself is the one who forbade mut'a marriage or temporary marriage. The hadith is narrated by Ali, who, I'm sorry, is narrated by uh, um, Al-Zuhri, who said that Al-Hasan, uh, the son of Muhammad ibn Ali, who, and his brother Abdullah, uh, told me that their father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, said to Ibn Abbas that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naha anil mut'ati wa an luhum al humur al ahliya zaman khaybar that during the battle of Khaybar the Prophet forbade nikah of al mut'a which is the temporary marriage and the eating of donkey's meat. The reference to the hadith is in the description of this video. As indicated by this hadith, the allowance of temporary marriage was associated with early military activities where the army soldiers had to spend prolonged periods of time away from their wives. However, such stress was alleviated through a later procedural organization limiting soldiers' service to periods of a maximum of four months before they are sent back home and replaced by other soldiers. Uh, especially when the Islamic community had numerically grew uh, to provide and was enough to provide military activities with their required human resources. As indicated, uh, military service period limitation was actually set by Omar ibn al-Khattab through consultation with married women in the city of Medina. This way, the need for temporary marriage was lifted and therefore it was banned. Nevertheless, there are other authentic hadith reflecting allowance of temporary marriage and those are pertaining to the early stages where it was needed before the later instructions from the Prophet that banned it. Therefore, some current YouTube active Islamophobes are abusing their viewers' lack of information about Islam and they claim that the Prophet allowed prostitution. This is how they presented it. They presented temporary marriage as prostitution. Are there any differences between temporary marriage and prostitution? Well, in prostitution, the woman has no rights at all. 
nor is the man obliged to acknowledge any offspring from her as his own children, nor do they inherit, of course. In temporary marriage, which is a marriage contract that has a starting date and an end of contract date, end of term date. This is the difference between temporary marriage and normal marriage, regular marriage. The husband has full responsibility towards his wife and towards his children from her. No difference between a normal marriage contract or a temporary marriage contract which has an end of term. The dowry should be granted exclusively to the bride. The approval of the bride and her family without any compulsion is needed. In case of divorce or end of marriage contract, the woman cannot remarry except after a wait period of three menstrual cycles to make sure that there are no children in her womb from that man. And if she was a woman who reached her menopause, she has to wait for 45 days. And if he dies, she waits for four months and 10 days, which is not the case with prostitution. It is actually the case with um, normal marriage. This does not discount the fact that Shia Muslim sects are still abiding by the early hadith allowing muta, muta marriage, uh, which is in contrast to the majority of mainstream Muslims. But it really shocks me that someone like David Wood, as a Christian student of theology, used this cheap way of attributing allowing prostitution to our beloved Prophet Muhammad and to Islam. He forgot two things. Number one, he forgot that Islam cannot be competed with when it comes to chastity. Number two, he forgot that he, his Christian background does not allow him to even try to compete with Islam or to even mention prostitution at all. And I will tell you why later. But first of all, the religion that has set very strict rulings for the attire of the women that they should be covered from head to toe except for their faces and hands is definitely a religion of chastity and cannot be called a religion that allows prostitution. Except by a crazy hater whom his hatred blinded his eyes. Second, the religion that has set very strict etiquette of interaction between men and women is a religion of chastity, definitely not prostitution. Third, if I were you, David Wood, I would just shut my mouth. We never wanted to embarrass Christians and, and speak about these things. But you are pushing us. Do you know who allowed prostitution? Not Prophet Muhammad at all. But the main theologian of Christianity, Saint Augustine, who was adamant that prostitution should be recognized as a necessary social evil arguing that suppression of prostitution will overthrow society. His stance was predicated on a belief in men's sexual appetites necessitating access to sexual outlets outside of marriage in order to prevent them committing adultery and threatening their marriages. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Sex with a prostitute is not regarded as, a, as adultery in the eyes of Saint Augustine. And you come throw on us these things? Moreover, St. Thomas Aquinas, the most influential philosopher in the history of Christianity, whom they called the doctor of the church, he also had a similar views about the importance of allowing prostitution as a lesser of two evils. This is in his Summa Theologica. I really never wanted to embarrass Christians, but I wish all people read uh, this book, Sex in History by Ray Tannehill. She will, will tell you about how different uh, societies dealt with sex. The Islamic society, the Christian society, and the, the Christian societies actually, and the Jewish society, Chinese, Indians, and everything. It's a very good book. I will just uh, read for you a little bit from it. Uh, temple prostitution came to Europe. Uh, there was a church brothel in Avignon where the girls spent part of their time in prayers 
and religious duties and the rest of the time servicing customers, Christians only, of course, no Jews, no heathens, were permitted to cross the threshold. Pope Julius II was said to have um, was said to have been so impressed by the Avignon example that at the beginning of the 16th century he founded one just like it in the Eternal City itself, the Eternal City, the Vatican in Rome. Why is that? Because they were told that the believers have sex with their wives with passion. So they said, no way, this cannot be allowed to continue anymore. The sex is needed only for procreation. But if the believers cannot control their feelings and their passion, then they, they can do that with prostitutes. But, but the houses, Christian houses, should be kept clean from having passion. Actually, Ray Tannehill says here that the American woman until 1920s, the 20s of the last century, couldn't even kiss her husband. What's that? This complex with sex is in your head, not in Islam. It is in the uh, Christian uh, mind, Christian uh, mind, even, even if an atheist comes, but he comes from a Christian background. I would encourage you to do further internet researches on Avignon Church or Pope Julius II. You can reach numerous trails of these Christian Church sexual discretions. Finally, looking at all these conflicting views between Christian text practices and history, we can now understand why St. Augustine was saying this prayer. Give me chastity, but not yet. And I'm posting in the description of this video all the references of what I said. Thank you.